be here tomorrow morning supporting the call event, kicking it off, walking around, helping with what to say, various scripts, and helping uh, helping drive that event forward too. At 8.30. At 8.30. At 8.30. Yeah. 8.30 is when we start with role play to ramp up for it, and we'll start at 9. All right. Uh, today we have a special guest that has volunteered to come up and share some of his secrets and some of his thoughts. So let's give a big round of applause for one of the top leaders of one of the top groups in this office and this company, Mr. Don Lehner. Thank you. So we're just going to make this kind of casual and I'm going to ask some questions. Don's going to share some insights. If you guys have questions along the way, we'll open it up. So Don, tell us a little bit, you know, what did you do before real estate? How long have you been in the business? Just a little bit of background. Um, well, before real estate, I was working in an architectural firm out of the uh, St. George, Utah area, and I, in 1989, I ended up getting uh, an opportunity to buy a property here in Las Vegas. I assumed someone else's loan, so I was buying it with no money down, one of those have no money and get rich programs, if you will. And uh, it ended up leading from 89 to, um, from one property to two, to four, to four plexes, to multiple four plexes, to 20 unit buildings, et cetera. And in 2002, I ended up affiliating with Prudential at the time. And my agent prior to that was a um, Better Homes and Gardens agent than Prudential. It was actually Linda Hayes, you, some of you know her. Uh, she was my realtor at the time, so I was one of those uh, clients that were the prima donna client. How many of you had those? <laughs> I was that. And so I had to really apologize to her once I got into the business because uh, I learned a lesson because I got myself as a client and I was really demanding. So, but, uh, um, but it ended up working out in the end. So in 2002, I uh, started a, a team of agents because when I got into the business, it was initially to buy and sell for myself. But what I realized is that I had knowledge from what I was practicing before, which was building portfolios, and I had that information inside of me, and I was able to share that with my clients, and it took off from there. So how, when you first got started and decided to get into brokering and working as an agent, how did you generate you business? A little loud. Yeah, how, when you first got started working as an agent, how did you generate business when you first got started? What worked really well for you then? Well, when I started, I had realtors or, or people that were inspired to become agents uh, coming to me from outside of the field, and I started to build a team. And as I was doing that, I needed to show them exactly what to do to bring in clients. And I didn't really know for myself at that time, because it was 2002, I was just in the business on the real estate side of it, and I decided to do open houses. So it was actually right up here off of uh, Fort Apache uh, in the Lakes area, Angelfish Drive. I don't know if you guys know that street, but that is a money-making street. Actually, anything off of um, uh, any busy intersection uh, with one street in is your money-making opportunity. And what I did is I didn't have um, my own listings that I would say were in good areas or they were owner-occupied with furniture. So what I did is I actually just did a subdivision search of an area that I wanted to take over, if you will, and I looked for all the vacant properties and I called all the other co-brokers and made arrangements to get their home sold. And I basically started scripting myself and I scripted myself to talk to other brokers about how I was going to make them look good by getting their home sold on a, which was a vacant property that backed up to one of the busiest streets that was going to be hard to sell. So <clears throat> um, I would strategically pick that house because it may not sell because of all the traffic behind it because I know I could be there longer, I can anchor myself into the neighborhood, and I can get to know more people in that neighborhood. And by doing that, it generated over the first 30 to 60 days over 300 clients. The clients were in abundance, which they still are, and they would come in uh, about 10 clients a day, and my whole goal was to find out as much information as I could from them so that way I could find out what their transformation is that they needed, because if I was clear on that, then I would be able to deliver what they wanted. And you, you did what, one, two open houses? Uh, no, actually about three open houses a week. Um, that's kind of my rule of thumb for making about 120000 a year uh, was about three open houses a week. That's 18 hours uh, for the week. It's a part-time job, so I could keep my McDonald's job on the side, right? And then I could do that. But, the, uh, but about 18 hours a week is 120000 And um, as Matt and the rest of the team here, you know, beats into you over and over and over again. It's about showing up. It's about staying consistent. It's about doing what you do best and letting other people do the rest. So what do you attribute? Yeah, yeah. Did, did you get mostly buyers or did you also attract listings? Um, you know what was interesting is I went into it thinking, oh, I just got to work with buyers. But the sellers 
usually after your first week, they kind of know you're there. Into your second week in the same uh, subdivision, the sellers start to come around. And when they start to come around, they usually come around complaining about their realtor that isn't doing open houses for them. So you get invited over, you uh, start building the relationships, and then when those listings expire, you're pretty much right there ready to go. Um, so listings came out of that. <clears throat> yes. So you've been in the business now for about 25 years. You've been consistently growing and selling for over 12. What do you attribute your success to? Um, success comes from advanced planning. Uh, it's really big uh, with my group and my team that we always think about the end in mind. And we're not talking about the end of just a deal. We're talking about the big picture. What do we want to be? What do we want to become? Who do we want to influence? What transformation do we want to offer out to the world? How are we going to help people? And what system are we going to create with this advanced plan that's going to allow us to have the time freedom from doing the actual work? So we have uh, something in our office called 10 times growth. Everything that we do has to have a 10 times growth mechanism added to it, so that way it can run itself and get 10 times the results without us. So that's kind of my model. What, uh, why do you feel people fail in real estate? Um, I would say that they don't realize that they actually have all the tools that you need. I can guarantee, and I've said this many times, I mean, clients come to me and I know that I personally believe that I'm the best one, but I also believe that any other agent out there, and when a client is disgruntled about their agent, I always promote them back to the agent they started with, because I really believe that that was the right person for them in the beginning. That person may or may not believe that, but when I send um, the client back to their agent to find out, you know, I know that the agents are working hard, I know that their intention is to do the right thing, I know that um, the intention is to, you know, create some transition or, or lifestyle change for their clients. So I get that, and I know how hard it is to work in this business uh, through the ups and the downs, but I think that um, you definitely need to know that you are the best fit for your client, and you have to live up to that. It's living beyond who you think you are. It's, it's living towards who you know you need to become. And when you do that, and you can talk to your client on that level, they will stay with you. They will work with you, and they will do what's in their best interest, which is the right thing for them, which actually is closing the deal. So, just to paraphrase, what I heard you just say is most people fail because they don't believe enough in themselves, and they don't believe that they are the best to be working with each client that they are, and believing in the tools around them. How do you, you know, how have you, What's been most helpful for you or people around you in developing that? In regards to developing that, um, I would have to say it goes back to when the, uh, well, I think we always are on some journey in our lives. Um, and I think that uh, for me, the journey became more clear during the peak to the crash. Like when the peak was up in about 2005, six, it was, really, it was really good years in that time. I think I was doing almost 120000 a month at that point in income coming in. But then when 7, 8, 9, 10 came, it was the market had shifted and there had to be some reality checks. Why were we doing so good? What could I do to not have to let anyone go? And that was a pretty tough time because I actually reinvested in myself during the time of the crash to keep the foundation strong so I wouldn't have to terminate any associates that were working with the company. That's a sacrifice that I actually took for myself. I had my own inventory that went back to the bank. I had uh, inventory that I still was able to keep. But in doing that, it actually led me to uh, focus on what could I do best for my clients' needs as well. And it was never about the money. And that's the big mistake that a lot of people make is they get into this business because they're like, oh, time freedom and a lot of money. That's the biggest mistake that those people will usually make. That's about a one and a half year, one hit wonder type of a time frame. You actually have to get into it because you realize that you're doing something bigger than yourself. And if you can do it bigger than yourself and you can provide what your client needs, your clients will give you more clients and they'll become your scouts. They'll actually uh, work for you. Did that answer the question? So, right. what I heard, well, what I heard was one of the ways to do that was an intentional focus on self-development right. and investing in yourself and personal growth, which we talk about every single day, and which is the core of our message today. And I'm going to add to that. Yep. I'm going to add to that. And to to learn the most isn't just going to the classes, because we can all go to a class and we can hear it, but you have to take that information, you have to apply it, you have to get involved. Uh, I don't uh, know about who else is here on committees, raise your hands, committee members, all right? So we only have about 2% of us here that are on committees. I want you to know, it's a big thing to be on the committees. You actually learn the most when you're on the committees. Wouldn't that be true, Celeste? 
Oh yeah. It's, it's you're involved. You're really spending you're a lot hugely of time. involved. I, I like built a seat on the time. forms committee for probably going on five years now. It's one of my favorite committees. It gives me an advanced look at what's going on with the industry and the way that the documents go. Um, and uh, uh, so that's uh, a pretty neat thing to be in the position of. Another committee I'm on is the leadership committee at GLVR and what's great about that is we get to work behind the scenes with some of our upcoming you know, politicians and whatnot in regards to what um, our dollars are going to through NAR and through the Political Survivors Fund. You know, when you work on the back end of things like that, you actually get a learning curve. And also in that reinvestment, I belong to two mastermind groups. Um, I think I'm going to be getting involved with one that you guys are having here as well. And uh, in those mastermind groups, because you're putting into workshop skills, um, what will happen is you'll actually generate customers out of it because they'll understand where your growth is. They'll understand your commitment level to yourself and that will get you business because if you don't know your, your 20 second commercial about yourself, then your client doesn't know it either. And that's what you have to understand is you have to understand who you are, what you deliver, and how are you going to get that across in your 15 seconds with your client so that way they understand what they're going to get from you. Because if you cannot give that to them or you don't understand it about yourself, you are projecting confusion onto your client. And that could be part of the reason why they're not closing. So you have to really be clear on what their outcome is going to be and also what you do to achieve that outcome. If you had the, if you could go back to the beginning and start from scratch and you have to do it all over again, what would you do differently or what would you recommend over anyway? What would you do differently? Uh, what would I do differently? Um, well, I know that there are certain times in different markets that I would love to be able to just find my team and just be an agent on it. Um, but uh, what I would uh, say in that is that making sure that I'm aware that I could utilize the tools and put them more into use along the way. I mean, I'm pretty big on when I go to an education class, it's not just a get it to learn it to understand it, to get that CE is to actually take it and how am I going to implement this in some way shape or form how are we going to put this in to help serve others in some way shape or form and uh, understanding that so I think that if I was going to go back and do it again it would just basically be that I, if I could have the knowledge to get more involved sooner I would probably be at a much different level of volume even today so, so <clears throat> you, and you shared a little bit with me on this yesterday, so I'm going to paraphrase again, because I, I think this is one of the biggest things I explained with the whole engagement versus non-engagement and my personal experience with it, is you mentioned yesterday what I would do differently again is aggressively and intentionally seek out guidance, participation, and be engaged and participate in the resources around you. Yeah. And fully utilize everything. What, what a lot of associates, agents don't realize is that you have major tools in this company. Now, uh, I don't even need to do a raise of hands. By not raising your hands, who is it that uh, gets solicited all the time by other brokerages? It happens. It happens all the time. And uh, when I was building a team, I realized that I needed to be competitive in regards to the way I write my contracts. So I actually interviewed quite a bit and, and was solicited. I mean, Gary Keller had flown me to Texas twice to talk about going over with the Keller Williams model. And when you look at these other models, a lot of people think that, oh, the grass is greener, but I think those are the people that are not involved with their business where they're at. If you think that the grass is greener, huge, huge, huge mistake. The grass is only going to be greenest where you water it, and that's all it comes down to. The bottom line is, is Berkshire Hathaway, the tools that you have here are by far better and stronger than any other brokerage that I think I've ever interviewed with or, or met with. And what that leads me to tell you is that you have to plug in with what you've got. The tools are here. Use them. Take advantage of them. You're paying for them. You may as well. Um, and when you do the numbers, and knowing your numbers is big, because when you look at these other companies and they say, oh, well, the grass is so green over here, and you actually do the math, what is it going to cost me to work there because I have to do all this extra stuff myself that was being handled before somewhere else? That stuff comes with a cost. You must know your numbers, do your research, um, and you'll make a wiser decision. I definitely right. believe that. That wasn't in the script. I did not pay him to say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at your current level of production, what would you say is the biggest challenge that you or your group work to overcome? I would say the biggest challenge is mindset. And it's not because we're not motivated. I would say it's mindset of that there is a lot that we want to live up to in our standard. So we need to stay engaged in reaching those. It's really, we are pushing ourselves beyond who we think we are uh, almost every day. 
how, you know, to say, okay, how am I going to write a contract and how am I going to get ten times more growth out of writing just a contract is a big thing to, and, a, and a different thing to think about and a different way of looking at it. So everything that we do pushes us ten times harder and we have to get through that and we also have to be there for each other. So mindset is big. Uh, for me, I, I do a lot of things outside of my own group, uh, meaning that I go to other uh, programs, other uh, places to keep my mind in check. I'm actually a big believer in uh, staying with groups that are at your level or better, uh, so that way you continue to go to bigger levels. Surround yourself with uh, with uh, uh, workshops and groups, masterminds, if you will, uh, that will help push you. Like my mastermind cost me fourteen thousand a year, and uh, to be in that, and then more than that if you figure the travel expenses, because we're international groups, so we travel three times a year together for weeks at a time. And uh, in being in that group, they expect me to live up to a higher caliber, and so. Um, you know, being around that actually helps with the motivation piece of it. But I think that beyond motivation, you have to understand what your purpose is here in the experience. The experience for you, experience in life, whatever that is. If you understand what your, what your purpose is, that actually will pull you out of bed, and that would be your motivation. It actually drags you through what you want to achieve. All right, you want to open it up for any, anyone got any questions they want to ask Don? And just, yeah. yep, Nancy. Can you talk about 20 second presentation? Yeah, so for instance, if we were going to meet and you were my client, I would basically go into script mode. I typically do that. I actually feel like I press play in my head every so often and I just run a script. It's, um, it's why this stuff up here is so important. You know, you may say it's not for me, but even if it may not be for you on the scripting, I definitely suggest go to the classes. SSC may or may not be for you, but I definitely know that the scripts and the underlying uh, scripts that they have there is what you need to internalize to be able to use it off the cuff. So if I was to meet with any client and I was going to run my 15 second commercial, it would be something like, you know, hi, my name's Don Lehner. I, let me tell you a little bit about what I have. Basically, I, you know, put together a portfolio and I help my clients build portfolios for them that give them passive income streams. And I do this by uh, helping them buy either their first property or an entry level property. And then we teach them to build that portfolio into two to four to six. So I'm basically replaying the model of where I made my largest income. Um, but by understanding that enough about who I am, I can get that message across. But knowing who your audience is is key. Um, you can't just run an ad and then throw it out on the radio or on TV and expect to get your audience. You have to understand who you're targeting and speak directly to that target so that way you're going to get a return on that investment. Otherwise, you're just shooting bullets into the sky hoping you hit something. So know enough about what you do, how you do it, and get that across to your client quickly so they understand. And one thing that you could do, and that's a role play thing, if you have a group around you, you mention to them, you know, you know, hi, my name's Nancy, I happen to be in real estate, um, I, uh, you know, help people buy and sell properties, on top of that I hold business brokerage permit, whatever it is that you do, get that across and make it understandable and play that and bounce it off other people and if they can understand it, at least you're getting the message across quicker, you know, uh, so that way they understand who you are because a lot of people who are confused project confusion and the clients are like, well, do I work with them or not? It's kind of like if you met somebody and you don't let them know that there's a realtor or that you're an agent and you don't go for the appointment, then they'll probably not know that they have to set an appointment with you to buy a house. So you have to talk with them. Okay, so now that you know who I am, when do you want to buy your house? What are your days off? You know, part of the thing that I do is I script even my administration. And when we're working with our potential clients, they're required to fit in that first two minutes of the conversation when the appointment is going to be set. It's all about the appointment. If I'm on the phone, when's my appointment? If I'm in front of somebody, when's my appointment? And I always go for the close of the appointment. Okay. If you if you aren't clear or don't have your 30 second or 15 second pitch, come see us. Come to role play in the morning. We can focus just on that. Come to one of the roundtable events. We'll focus on what are you saying as your 30 second pitch to this particular group of clients you're going after right now, and we'll help you hone it. Any other questions for Don? Okay. All right. Go ahead. One more. <laughs> I'm a little unclear on the 10 times. 10 times growth. Okay. So. Um, uh, Without being too intrusive, uh, roughly how many transactions did you do this year? Seventeen. Seventeen. Figure out, to figure out a way to look back at what you did and how can you hone what you did to get seventeen to turn that into one hundred and seventy. Nice. <laughs>
Think <laughs> <laughs> okay, so ten times growth. Think about that thought process, though. That is a huge thought process. If you're looking at what did I do activity-wise or process-wise to generate what I did last year, and what can I just dial up in that process to put gas on the fire and fuel results a little bit higher, a lot higher. <laughs> but if you're thinking there, well, that seemed impossible. Though I mean, I always thought that you should. I don't have time to think about that piece. Um, interesting that you say that. I don't have time to think about that piece because I'm too busy focused on what is it going to take. So if I'm focused on what it's going to take, I have no energy for is it impossible or not. It's only going to be possible because that's the only energy I've given it. And now if it works out that way or not, the numbers will show. But you definitely need, I mean, but if I did let the other way take my energy, I've just delayed getting to the possibility of could it happen. Who would be, who would be disappointed if they took that approach, that thought process, tweaked the activities that were ramped up and did 30, 50 percent more or double what they did last year. Who would be upset if just the process resulted in that kind of process? Right. And again, process that's end in mind thinking too, because what will that look like? And you know, um, what what does that need to look like? If you if you say, well, here's the goal, and you then reverse engineer how the steps need to go to get to that goal, then that's helping you reach that ten times growth. All right, let's give Don a big round of applause. For Alright, who's got some wants and